As mentioned, my name is Alquin Whitus, and I'm the Senior Principal Data Architect at GE Aerospace within our strategic shared services organization. And what that means for our organization is that we host and we maintain and manage the strategic analytic platforms that our business builds uh, their data products and analytics on top of. So with that power, as I'm sure you all imagine, comes some great responsibility. So I'm very excited to tell you about our story, about our usage of the Amazon Redshift technology. And before we jump into that, I just want to just give you a little bit of uh, an about our business look at GE Aerospace. When thinking of GE Aerospace, I had no other, where to, no other place to start than with our purpose statement. So we invent the future of flight, we lift people up, and we bring them home safely. That's something that every member of our team holds deeply within um, their own their own views of themselves and the company. And it's not just a belief we all have, but it's a responsibility we take with the products we build. And I really thought there was no better way to connect that mission and that purpose to you all than with this uh, story in terms of numbers. So if we look at the numbers here, every two seconds an aircraft with GE engine technology is taking off around the world. Three fourths of all takeoffs are powered by GE technology. And the one that's perhaps the most impactful, over 650,000 people are flying at any given time with GE engine technology. I can imagine many of you flew on these aircrafts as we were all getting into Las Vegas for reInvent. So this is something that's able to connect each and every one of us to, to GE Aerospace and to our company. Now getting into the story of our data modernization and how we were able to do that with Amazon Redshift, I first wanted to take you back um, roughly about 10 years ago where our story started. So we like to think of this as our data lake 1.0. Um, what this meant is this was our first foray into the data lake type of pattern. So I'll give you a, a bit of some metrics around the type of scope and the type of user base that we serve, and also a, a bit of a look into our tech stack that we were then able to modernize over the last roughly two and a half years. So within our Data Lake 1.0 scope, we had 300 or so source systems around our business that are all brought together that allow our citizen developers the chance to build trusted analytics and data products in our environment. These source systems come from all over the business, and they are made up of ERP systems, finance systems, mainframes. Um, you name it, we probably have it. And all told, this is over 100 terabytes of data. And what this means is it's a lot of data ingest, but it's also a lot of data creation. When I mentioned data ingest, we have roughly 15,000 or so base tables. When we say base tables, these are the tables that we are bringing into this analytic environment. And then we serve up those tables for all of our developers to build on top of. Now, as you can imagine, that next stat that says we have over 100,000 data objects that means we have a lot of creation within this environment. So we bring in 15,000 objects or so, but the real power comes from all those developers and those data product engineers that are building the analytics within the environment. And all told, we have thousands of data developers around the business that are using this environment and relying on it to power their trusted analytics and to power their business processes. From a tech stack perspective, um, this tech stack, I think, does not look uh, that different than many others around this room. Um, we had an enterprise partner ELT solution. So for that, that means we have one doing continuous change data capture, as well as one that's funneling bulk data transfers into our environment. It's a very uh, typical truncate reload type of pattern. We also had a powerful MPP data warehouse. And then we had built some custom orchestration tooling that was really a key enabler for our end users to be able to build and maintain their own pipelines within our environment. Now, at the end of this data uh, platform, we have our BI and reporting layer. This is where the majority of our users interact with our data and interact with the analytics that are built within this environment. And some of them may even take advantage of our low-code tooling around advanced analytics. So what that means is they're able to access some more advanced languages, something like Spark, Python, R, to build and maintain their analytics within this environment. And all told, this environment was running on-prem 
as I mentioned, we started about 10 years ago. And so it was a powerful environment, but it obviously had with it some limitations. I mentioned those limitations. When it really comes down to it, our legacy platform lacked agility. So it could be as powerful as it wanted to be, but what we were hearing from our business community and from our end users and those that were out there building and powering these analytics is they demanded more. Our lengthy hardware and software procurement cycles sometimes took upwards of six months to uh, plan ahead and to think in terms of scale and licensing needs that we would need to enable to allow our business to continue developing and continue building these very powerful analytics. So that six month time frame that could be challenging, um, I like to think of it as tossing a ball out in front and just doing your best to make sure that you estimate correctly how far out in front you had to toss it because then eventually your usage of the environment catches up to it. And not only that, but we had a very monolithic system design. Now that isn't always inherently a problem, but it, it was for us, it was fragile, and everything funneled through one shared pool of compute, and we had a lot of competing interests uh, operating within this monolith that actually tested that fragility on a day-to-day -day basis. And lastly, when we talk analytics, we have to talk the value and the power they bring to the business. So a problem we had with our legacy environment dealt with the fact that it was siloed off. Um, as I mentioned, it was on-prem, but what that meant was this really strategic storage layer was not able to be tapped into from all of the different areas of our business or all of the teams that were already adopting cloud, as an example. So with these limitations and with this need for agility and flexibility, um, that's when roughly two years ago we embarked on an effort to modernize this platform and to take it to the next level and to partner with AWS in doing so. So you may ask yourself why Amazon Redshift? And for us, it was about addressing those issues with our, our Data Lake 1.0 platform. And also it was about making us nimble, allowing us to um, do right by our end users and, and do right by those users that were testing that fragility uh, day in and day out. So from an Amazon Redshift perspective, the flexible and scalable storage layer was something that set us up for the future from day one. So we looked at that and with the advent of newer features like concurrency scaling and different innovations within Amazon Redshift, we knew that the service would scale with us and as we threw more at it, it would be able to catch that and handle it. Not only that, but it was a technology and it was a partner that was ready to support our more distributed business. So our business built up around our data lake and the way analytics were built in that environment was very centrally done. But what we've seen over the last few years is a more distributed architecture within our company. And we have numerous decentralization efforts underway. And so we had to be able to support that with our technology as well. So Amazon Redshift did that, and it allows us to adopt a more data mesh type pattern with something as big and critical as our data lake environment. And lastly, and something I'll get into with an architecture diagram and, and some looks ahead, um, the deep integrations of the ecosystem. So that's something that we were extremely excited to embrace with Amazon Redshift and their AWS partner services, because that allowed us to unify much more of our analytics and bring them into an area where other teams, other domains, other parts of the business could interact with this critical layer without us having to move everything around or, or send copies off to other parts of the business. <coughs> so when we talk about unified, it's, it's hard to, to do that and not also talk about trust because for us, those two go hand in hand. So, uh, this this uh, is a pretty stock image that you probably see all the time of modern architecture. But what I want to do is really dig into the main point of trust here. We look at the Amazon ecosystem and we look at Amazon Redshift and the S3 type of layers. And it's that unification of these services that allows us to evolve our architecture and adopt a more modern approach to doing it. In the process, we also get to deliver more trusted analytics to our end users. And really, the first way we do that is just by breaking down silos. So silos are uh, very, very challenging in terms of trust. 
and what we've observed from our legacy data platform is they tend to promote duplication of data. So we have what we like to think of as copy sprawl everywhere. So everyone loves even some of our, our most widely used data sets, but they copy it and use it for themselves. And that can be a pretty challenging situation to be up against. So what we are looking for is a way to be able to unify the storage, to not have to copy it to make use of it, and to actually build our technology in a way where the right behaviors were encouraged. In order to do that, we had to embrace the culture of produce once, consume many. So more of like a, a modern pub sub take on data warehousing. This allowed us to start to normalize this idea of producers and consumers within our environment. And again, it's another behavior encouragement. So we are now able to encourage the behavior of producing really important and trusted data sets, but also listening to your consumer community and allowing them to consume in place as opposed to having to copy everywhere to make use of your data. And lastly, and I alluded to it before, but that decentralization of our business and that domain orientation. The modern architecture sets us up perfect for that. You hear domain orientation, data mesh, all of those things, you know, we want them. Because essentially our business is saying they're organizing themselves in a similar fashion. And so our technology should, should align with that and should actually encourage the right behaviors. So all of this being told, we believed in Amazon Redshift. We took on this modernization journey. And we were ready to kick it off roughly two and a half years ago. And I am now happy to share with you our end state solution architecture as well. So again, this may be a familiar type of chart you see, um, albeit with some, some small or slight nuances. But I'll talk you through it, and I'll hit on some key points here. But, but really, this is the platform and solution architecture that we were able to get to that then delivered on the promise of all of those items we wanted to address and modernize in the process. So from left to right, we still bring in those data sources. We still bring in those 300 or so source systems. And we bring them into our producer landing zones. So we have isolated at an account and cluster level our ability to produce data out to the rest of our environment. Um, this supports not only our current environment, but that growing trend of decentralization. When we bring data in, we process it through EMR. And we store it in one of the big three open table formats. So we deliver on that lake house architecture in the process before we even get to our Amazon Redshift layer. From there, we sync our tables with Amazon Redshift and produce out. On the right side, you see our consumer cluster account. This is the area where the bulk, if not all, of our end users interact with our data. They interact with it on Amazon Redshift, or they interact with it through some of the different partner AWS ecosystem services. Um, EKS, advanced analytics, and our BI and dashboarding solution as well. And something you may notice from this chart and from this, this architecture diagram is the fact that we're able to serve different user personas. So within our business, that's the reality. We have different personas. We have a growing compliance need for at least privileged access. And we're able to do this within our solution, but then share data across or as we like to think of it, reading down um, if it's warranted from persona A to persona B. So we're able to do this and we're able to still be, uh, be forward in terms of compliance and cybersecurity of our environment. And that's extremely important to us because safety of this data and these analytics is always number one. And a another call out I'll make here, because you may have seen the icon, is the fact that all of this is running within the GovCloud or more protected regions of AWS was an extremely big win for us. Um, as you can imagine, we take advantage of a few very cutting edge features in this architecture. And in deep partnership with the Amazon Redshift team and a lot of teams across AWS, these advanced features are being delivered to the GovCloud regions. And that's something we're able to tap into and protect our data at the same time as giving our end users and our business community this more monitored architecture. So that was a huge win all around.
Now, before moving off and, and why I can stand up here and also have confidence in the solution and confidence in what we have moving forward is we have this, this cloud promise. We have the fact that the as-built performance features keep being released. We have the, the numerous announcements that happen at reInvent and all throughout the year. And that continuous investment in the service in Amazon Redshift is something that gives us and our business confidence in partnering with AWS to make sure that we're delivering not only for our users today, but our users tomorrow. So what this means is we're able to deliver these, these features to our end users and deliver on that cloud promise where these are released sometimes overnight. And what that means is the very next day, workloads run better. We have Im improved performance across our BI and analytic use cases. Or maybe it's just the simple fact that your dashboard loads a little faster. So items like Redshift serverless, autonomics, or improvements in the auto WLM are the types of things that when released, they are just background processes that we take advantage of. Data lake analytics and all of the good, goodness you see happening with Spectrum and improved glue data catalog management, that's again something that we take advantage of with that open table layer. And really, I, I mentioned the ability to scale. Concurrency scaling is at the heart of that. So anytime that we are improving concurrency eligible operations, that's just a scenario where our scale is improved, our, our time and our performance is improved on our BI workloads. And I'll leave you with all the things that probably aren't even on here. So we saw some really fun and exciting announcements in the way of LLM and Redshift ML. It just keeps getting better, and that's really the promise that we want to make sure we are set up to pass right along on to our users and to allow our data product community uh, an ecosystem that really gives them that thriving place to, to design and keep building value for their business processes. All right, well, I want to say thank you for hearing our, our journey and letting me tell the story of our modernization.